Whether you're looking for answers to specific life questions or seeking to become the best version of you possible, welcome to the Mental Breakdown and Psych Reg podcast, where we offer insight, information, and strategies based upon research and years of practice as clinical psychologists. So sit back, have a listen, and get connected with our hosts, Dr. Bernie Wilkinson and Dr. Richard Marshall. Welcome back. Richard, we just finished an awesome interview with uh, Brian Keane. <laughs> he is from Ireland, and we actually interviewed him and with we, him in Ireland. He is in Ireland. Yeah. And what, let me tell you what I, what I noticed first that was a little bit troubling is that I could see the window. Yes. And, and it, it was, was bright and sun shiny. <laughs> And it's so dreary here. Because? <laughs> We're in Central Florida. Well, it's not dreary. It's dark. It's nighttime. <laughs> well, most of the time, uh, the, these, this time of year right now, it's been so rainy here all the right. time and, and mm-hmm. gray and cloudy. And you, you see the, the window there and it's bright and sunshiny. Is, there about a, is it six or seven hours? Six five. Hours, five hours five different. Hours so 6.30, 11.30. Yeah. So it was almost noon. It was almost it was noon. noon when, and he had this bright sunlight yeah. coming in the window and it's we're great. here in the in the jungle in the yeah. steaming jungle of That's central great. florida but it was a great interview oh, it was. brian is um he he is he is a man of many hats he is what all of us want to be yeah he's smart he's attractive he's generous yes. to his fault and it, he's in incredible shape he's right. a, with actually a fitness model right um at one point um but high energy yes yes Ooh. So Brian it came on to talk about his book uh, entitled The Fitness Mindset. And it, it is not just your run-of-the-mill yeah. uh, fitness this book. Is, this is truly a different take, a yeah. different approach to yeah. this whole question. Absolutely. Yeah. He, the, the, he opens it with um, fantastic information about, right. about nutrition and, and a lot of the lifestyle things that we talk about all the time here on the podcast, exercise, uh, diet, sleep, mm-hmm. you know, stress management, all of those things. He, he talks about all that throughout the book. Um, so he starts out with the fitness stuff, and then there's an entire section. Like the whole second half of the book. On just the mental aspect right. of, of being, being fit and being healthy. And why it's so difficult for all of us right. to get to those places, right. to, to achieve our goals and to get to those places where we want to be. Yeah. But Brian has a wonderful way of making very complex issues easy to understand. Right. Um, one of the questions we asked him was about trans fatty acids because everybody mm-hmm. talks about it, but Brian has this way of explaining it so that it makes sense. So right. if you read his stuff and say, oh, that's what that's what a trans fatty acid right. does and why it does it. Right. Yeah. So it's yeah. really, really worth worth it. This book is really different. Yeah. It's really good. He, he talks about, um, you, you know, you, you think about he's a, a fitness expert and you think huh. about, okay, so he exercises a lot and things like that. Mm-hmm. Well, he also reads two to three books a week. Right. He um, reads Greek he, and Roman philosophy. <laughs> right. He, he was a school teacher yeah. uh, for, yeah. for four Elementary years. School teacher. Um, it's just, he, he is so well-rounded. He has had so many life experiences and he, and he pours all of that into this book. Right. Um, a book that I, I think everyone should read us, you know, not just those of you who are, interested in, in, in improving your mm-hmm. fitness and, and physical health and that kind of stuff. But anyone, the, the approach that he takes to life in general is just wonderful. And yet the other thing that I really like about him, he's so self-effacing, you know, right. and, and he says over and over again, I was like, I had the same problems. I right. have exactly the same problems that you have. I, yeah. I did it for this reason. I was overweight. I was eating fast foods. I was doing all the stuff. And, um, and, and so I know how hard it is. Mm-hmm. I know how difficult it is. I know that you want to stop. I right. know that you don't want to keep going because he has really done that. Right. And so it makes it easier to follow because you can identify right. easily with Brian. Very yeah. likable guy, yeah. too. He, he's, he is he's very likable. fun to be with, and, and this except will I not, couldn't keep up with him. <laughs> this will not be the last time we no, talk we'll with him. him we, we'll, we'll certainly talk with him again because um, he's just, he is just so much information. We, right. we only really scratch the surface right. of, of so much of the things that we could talk about yeah. with him. So he, he will be back. But uh, in the meantime, in the show notes, there are links yeah. to all of his um, all of his outlets uh, via mm-hmm. social media. He's on everything. So you can follow and He's everywhere. Now, what's what's amazing, <laughs> wow. and, and I, I, I need I want to test this. He says that he, he posts something different on all of the different outlets. So follow them all. 
uh, you know, Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat. Um, he's got a blog. He's got a website. He's got podcasts. So there's something on every outlet that will be a little bit different uh, for you to, to check out. So um, Very impressive. Yeah. So we hope you enjoy this interview. Uh, we, we used Skype this time. We don't, mm-hmm. we don't usually use Skype. And so we have a split screen. And so we... Uh, and you have a split professional... <laughs> On the split screen, really only included half of me in this interview, but it we'll forgive him for the it technological. Didn't, it didn't show that. He said it we was recording. accidental. We didn't show that when we were recording, so I did. I had no idea, but um, but it's okay. We'll, we'll figure that part out. Maybe I can change something with our camera or something. But uh, um, we'll or, see. You know, we'll see. Maybe we'll see. <laughs> so, but it, but it is it is a split screen, so it's a little bit different than what we yeah. usually have. Um, but it, it was a. I think that the. The audio and video came out very well. Yeah, it did. Um, yeah, I so was, I was pleased. We, we need to look Skype into usually more. doesn't work that well. And yeah. I don't mean From your criti- experience? I don't mean to be critical, but usually it's grainy or there's oh. a lag or, um, you know, between um, the, the voice and the mm-hmm. video mm-hmm. don't sync well. But oh, yeah. this was really, uh, yeah, yeah, it worked real well. I've, so. never, I've never really used it, so, that's, yeah. so I thought it was mm-hmm. really great. So, All right. I hope you enjoy it. If you have any questions, if you have any thoughts, you know, we'd love to hear from you about those. Mm-hmm. Um, and we'll... Get back to you and try to help how we can. Right. So, all right. Enjoy the interview. And from half of me, (laughs) enjoy. Just the right half. It's all right. The right half. There's no right half. The right half is the better half. Okay. (laughs) Okay. Enjoy the pot. What did I say? Enjoy the pot. Enjoy the podcast. Yeah. Enjoy the podcast. Right. Hopefully, I will be. There we go. Now I'm (laughs) honest. All right. How are you doing? This I feel like this has been a long time coming, so thank you so much. <laughs> it has been for it us does. too. <laughs> it's you know, and and we've been, I've been working with it with Skype too, because as I said, this is our first time with it. Um, it, it it's actually pretty easy to use. Yeah, it's what I use for all any 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 interviews and stuff I do. I always use Skype because it's literally just Skype recorder, click, and direct upload. It's great. <laughs> That's fantastic. So you you've had a busy morning already so far. Yeah, yeah, we've got a campaign. The um, the Irish rugby team are doing a campaign for their New Jersey, and I'm helping them with their strength and conditioning for a uh, cross promotion thing. Um, but uh, yeah, good complaint. If you ever hear me complain about being too busy, you can slap me. That's a great complaint to have. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't dare slap you. <laughs> <laughs> you can like uh, digitally. Slap I'll pretend. Me. Okay, <laughs> a virtual slap. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. How are you doing? How's everything on your side? Good, good, good. Hot and humid. Yes. Yeah. So where yep. is, it? Is, it, is it? Florida you're in? Florida. Florida. Okay. Mm-hmm. Right, okay. Yeah. Central, I've never been. It's, it's on my Florida. List. Yeah. Oh, okay. So yeah, you're, you're in the thick of somewhere there. You've got a... Yeah. For... <laughs> yeah we, no, I, I went out yesterday afternoon and it was it was raining and, and stepped out and it was raining. So you think rain is going to be a little bit cool out, you know, just comfortable yeah. and it was so humid even while it's raining it mm-hmm. was it was hard to breathe it was terrible yeah that's amazing that, that's i can't even fathom it we, we get rain we get rain but it's cold rain so yeah. <laughs> very very different yeah it knows how to rain in ireland in florida it's a little confused <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah exactly yeah at least we get steady rain it's like oh well, at least we can bring a jacket <laughs> right, right right can you hear me okay because my mic is hooked up here hopefully you can hear me i'm okay sound yeah, wise good. yeah, yeah. perfect awesome Deadly. Hey, Brian, we're going to call you Brian, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah, go for it. Call okay. me whatever you like. Before I've been called a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> we, we can't do that. We're on the air now. <laughs> and we have children watching. Um, <laughs> listen, uh, before we start, we got to talk about Gaelic football. What the, he- what the heck is Gaelic football? So Gaelic football is kind of like a mixture between basketball, rugby, and soccer. It's like a combination of the three sports. So it's not completely dissimilar to NFL, um, except there's a lot more endurance aspects. So if you think of soccer and NFL, it's like a combination. So that's why a lot of the guys that play are quite big guys. Um, it's full contact. We don't have any pads. We don't have anything like that, like rugby. Um, and But there's a lot more endurance like soccer in terms of the you're scoring into a goal on each side and there's goalkeepers. Um, so that was the sport I grew up playing. That's the, the national sport in Ireland. Um, it's it's the number one thing here above everything else. Um, but I grew up playing that for twenty years. <laughs> okay, wow. Brian. Now I have to ask you: this is this is football without pads, right? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah effectively. Yeah, yeah. and we don't a... have the same tackle. You're allowed to tackle side on, but you can't tackle directly front like in football. Um, and there's a bit more um, technical ability in terms of the kicking styles where football is a lot more hand-eye coordination and there's a lot more foot-eye coordination in, in Gaelic football. Mm, okay. Wow. Well, Doc, Bernie's a uh, nationally certified soccer, the other football. Soccer. Yeah, soccer coach. yeah your football. <laughs> yeah, right, right. But he's a, he's a soccer coach, so. Yeah. Um, yeah. But we were, we were thinking about Gaelic football and we watched a video and I thought, my gosh, it looks like football without pads. That's, right? Yeah, and wear helmets. Or Brian, really, without yeah, helmets. A lot of Irish people watch NFL because there's a lot of crossover in terms of the, um, the physical ability and the skill set. There's a lot of crossover with kicking and things like that. So it's um, people that have, uh, the NFL is huge in Ireland too. You know, people follow it, but it's because oh, yeah. our national sport and there's a bit of cross. And then our other sport, which is hurling, is just like lacrosse. So um, I think either either America copied Ireland or Ireland copied America. Someone copied someone somewhere, um, but they're very, very similar. Yeah, we, we probably copied you. We're younger. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's fair right. <laughs> Hey, listen. Let's let's get into this. Uh, we have a we have a ton of questions for you. Um, right. The first one is in in your book. You talk about uh, the chapter on nutrition. Yeah. You you keep referring to real food. Um, talk to us about real food. What is real food? So real food, and in the context of the book, and even on my platforms, and I talk about it, is effectively food that hasn't been altered and processed. Um, so, for example, the the best example I give in the book is whole grain rice that you get normally that you buy it in Whole Foods or you buy it in the local supermarket or you buy it wherever it is and then you've got your microwavable processed package that has removed fiber and then and they've removed vitamins and minerals and they've added in preservatives in order to give it a longer shelf life. So when I say real food, it's basically food that's nearly in its unaltered state and that they haven't removed the good stuff, the fiber, the thing that keeps you satiated, your vitamins and minerals that are vital for overall functioning of everything in your body, they get removed in processed food. So when I say real food, it's basically just food as close to its real form as possible. Mm -hmm. um, what I mean by that. Yeah, I think that, so it sounds like what we refer to that as, um, or most of the writers are here refer to it as just whole food. Um, yeah. Food yeah. In, its, in its natural state, as you said. That's okay, Right. that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So anything, before it's before it's processed in any way right in other words it's, yeah, it's, it's, effectively like there, there's certain things that you're not going to have a direct effect on like i always say with things like meat you're better if you can get your chicken that hasn't been pumped full of antibiotics and things like that right. but in some cases it's harder and I, particularly in the u.s because you don't have the same regulation as it was we have in, in europe so a lot of the antibiotics and stuff we're not allowed to use in our meat um whereas they don't have those regulations in the states it's why Whole Foods and other supermarkets like that can sell at a lot much higher price and they have to because it, it, you can buy a lot more meat at a cheaper price in the US. So it, it, that's where the line blurs a small bit because it's still real food. It's just been pumped full of antibiotics and different ingredients that may not be beneficial for your health long term. Um, but there's a little bit of a blur line with that. It's, so I talk about in the book that you're always better to source your meat, source your food from places that you know there hasn't been things added to it, just for overall health, for your body composition, um, for your energy levels, for all these things. They just tend to support people much better, um, even though I know it can be a little bit more costly, particularly in the US. Um, but again, look, look, bar farmers markets and things like that are, are the way to go largely, um, because what you pay up front now with, with the extra $2 or $3, you save in hospital bills in 30 years. Mm -hmm. yeah. that's, that's true, yeah. There's been a lot of, uh... A lot of reports have come out talking about the the, the preventative costs of, of healthier eating like that, and you know it's yeah. it is better in the long term. There, there's just that bit of a sacrifice at the beginning when you're paying you know that little bit more for for the healthier stuff, but in the long term it does certainly pay yeah. off. Yeah, well, I put it even in the book. I love the Benjamin Franklin quote that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, um, or a pound of prevention is worth an ounce of cure. Like it's um, it's a case that even when you see all the actual physical signs of your body, because when you're eating those foods that haven't been pumped for hormones and haven't been added in processed ingredients, your energy levels increase. So you actually need to eat less of it to get the same nutritional return. So it kind of balances out a small way when you frame it that way. Um, and then when your energy levels are higher, I know myself that anytime I ever miss a workout or a run or I didn't want to 
play with my wife. I've got a two-year-old when I've been tired. I was down to not having energy. So when you have your nutrition on point and you're eating the right foods that are giving your body energy, you can do more things with your business. You can do more things with your family. You can do more exercise because you have the energy. Sometimes it's not down to loving or hating exercise or doing things. It's down to just being tired and not having the energy. Fixing your nutrition and making sure you're eating foods that provide your body with energy allows you to do all of these things more optimally is what I found with people that I, with myself and people that I work with. Okay. Mm. Uh, absolutely. Brian, on this, uh, staying on nutrition for a minute, um, we spend, um, every, everything in this country is about trans fats. We hear trans fat this, trans fat that, trans fat that. Um, in your book, you give a very good, clear explanation of exactly what trans fats are. I'm thinking about our listening audience. Can you explain to them, as you do in your book, exactly what trans fatty acids are? Okay, so to keep it as simple as possible, um, and I'm not going to get too much into the science on it, but when you see the chemical makeup of the fatty acid, you can see it's, you know, it's, it's hydrogen ion and it's actual chemical makeup. A trans fatty acid, so for those that don't know, trans is the Latin word for opposite side. So trans fatty acid, transgender, transmutation, transformation is, is the opposite side. So you, you transfer something, you change it over. When you see the chemical makeup of a fatty acid, it's got its hydrogen ions on the opposite side, which effectively means when you eat foods that are high in fatty acids, your fast foods, your deep fried foods, when you eat those foods, your body doesn't recognize what it is because of its chemical makeup, which basically means when you eat it, it, your body's number one job is to keep you alive. So when it eats a food that it doesn't recognize like that, the safest place it can put it is into fat stores so it keeps your vital organs safe. So what happens is when you eat those foods, they get go right into your fat stores. They bypass nearly everything, courses, digestive things, and all of the uh, calories in, calories out, all the things that happen from an exercise point of view and a, a digestion point of view. But the simplest term is that it goes to the fat stores in your body. Um, and that's on, on top of all the inflammatory negative responses it can have, it's going to increase your body fat by having it mm. um, because your body doesn't understand what it is effectively. Okay. Right. And, and the, the easiest way to avoid that is with fried foods. Right. Right. Because yeah. in our country, we keep these vats of fat uh, warm all day and we keep using them over and over and over and over. And that builds up the trans fats in yeah. those oils, right? Yeah. And that's what happens. And then it's it's that kind of compound effect over time where it just gets worse and worse and worse. Right. Um, and by all means, like I'm the first one to say for some people that if you want to have your fast food once a week and that's the thing that keeps you on track all week, by all means, you can factor it in. It's when you're doing it every single day and you're going to McDonald's or you're going to Wendy's or you're going to a fast food chain every single day is when you can have that compound of negative effect on your body composition, your body fat, your energy levels, your brain, I get really bad brain fog if I eat fast food and trans fatty acids, mm -hmm. like things like that. Um, are very, very, it's just important to understand. And the, the reason I wrote the book, and I didn't say don't eat trans fatty acids. I was like, well, here's what happens. And then it's up to you whether you factor it in, um, but at least you know what's happened to your body and why those foods aren't supporting you. And then what you choose to do with that information is kind of allows you down whether you want to factor it in or not. So you feel the effect immediately. If you eat uh, well, I quickly. would now, like it's the same as uh, the example I always give to people is like, if you've never drank alcohol and right. you have your first drink and you feel a bit of a buzz after one drink, you're like, whoa, that's how I feel now after cutting fast food for, it's nearly 10 years since I've eaten fast food. Like I lived in California, I lived in San Francisco um, and I ate a lot of fast food when I lived in California. Um, because just it was, it was handy, it was easy. I totally get why people do because if you're busy and you're tired, you just want to get something quick that fills you up, uh, which is ironic because your energy levels actually are worse because you're not getting the vitamins and minerals and all the stuff that you actually need. But I didn't know that at the time, 10 years ago. But now when I eat fast food or anything that's been deep fat fried, I feel really, really sick. Um, and I, my brain feels like it's slowing down because of just obviously the, re the response my body's having. Similar to if you've never had alcohol and then you have a shot of vodka or tequila, you're like, oh, your body kind of feels it straight away. But what happens the same way is if you're someone that's an alcoholic and you drink every single day, you can drink five or six beers and not feel any effect. Right. It's the same with fast food. So it's not until you cut it and then reintroduce it and you start to feel sick and feel your brain isn't as clear that you realize how it was affecting your body all along. Right. You, you know, it's great to even sort of conceptualize it that way because one of the things that we work on with our patients is, is you know, physical health and mental health, you know, trying to combine the two because, you know, you, you, you hit on a really important key word just a moment ago with inflammation. 
you know, we, we know so much research is coming out now about the effects of uh, biological inflammation and its impact on not just physical health issues, but also mental health issues. And, uh, yeah. you know, a couple of years ago, I, I cut out gluten, had no idea that it would have even been an issue for me, but I knew I was going to start recommending it for my patients. And yeah. now it, it takes it, it takes literally just a, a couple of bites of something with gluten in it. And, you you know, I, I know immediately that it has it in there and it, it it's troublesome <laughs> yeah 100 percent. i am um, it's the exact same thing and it's, it's funny because when you're consuming gluten every single day or you're consuming fast foods every single day or you're consuming alcohol every day your body doesn't get a chance to realize when, when you cut it for two weeks three weeks four weeks two weeks two months three months and then you reintroduce it that negative effects you were having that all along it's just your body got adapted to it right. you know so it's a real sign like there isn't too many people that will cook up, cut out broccoli or asparagus and then have that kind of negative when they add it back in oh. you know so it kind of gives you an idea yeah absolutely absolutely well you, you mentioned alcohol yeah. um and you know there's some some information and some evidence that it too kind of creates some inflammation and some issues in your body tell, tell us a little bit about the effects of alcohol Alcohol is one of those I have a little bit of a love-hate relationship with because in terms of body composition, and I get it, I'm pure Irish on this one. <laughs> Thank you. You saved us from yeah, saying it. Justify me. Um, no, but the, the truth is there's, there's, there's benefits. In, in, from a body composition point of view, in terms of losing body fat, you can't. your body won't use fat as a fuel source while there's alcohol in your body. Effectively, what happens to alcohol is it jumps to the front of your queue as an energy source. So as people, how the reason, the way we work for energy is we run off glucose. So carbohydrates we eat get converted into glucose and that gives our body and inner brain energy to live effectively. Again, there's other things like ketosis and people that are in a keto diet, but for the 99% of people, we run off glucose. What happens with alcohol is it goes to the front of the queue. So when you, that's why if you've ever gone out and you've had six or seven beers or a few drinks and then you go for a run or even in a humid, it's very humid where you are now, you feel like you're sweating alcohol out because your body is using it as a fuel source. So you can't burn body fat or build muscle while your body is detoxifying itself of alcohol. That's a bit of a catch 22. So one thing is if you're not where you want to be with your body fat levels or your energy levels or all these things, it's only going to put an extra wall for you to jump over. However, if you are happy with, say, for example, the way you look and you add it back in, at least you're going to be able to burn through it pretty quickly. The main negative side of alcohol is obviously it's affecting inflammation in the body, but it's just, it's a displacing agent when you have it with food. So some of the vital minerals and vitamins your body needs, things like folic acid, vitamin B12, zinc, particularly for men, um, like zinc is your precursor for testosterone in men. So if you're having a steak and then you're having a few beers with it, all the benefits of eating that steak that's giving you the zinc is being displaced. It's effectively not being absorbed because alcohol works as a displacing agent. So again, it's a bit of a catch-22. Moderation, some people factor it in. Like I have people that come through some of my programs that have their few drinks every Saturday night and that's their free meal and that's what, that's what keeps them on track for the rest of the week. So it's very much kind of reverse engineering what works best for you. And again, similar to the trans fatty acids in the book, I didn't say don't or do have alcohol. It's a case of, well, here's what's happening. And then whether you decide to factor it in is going to be down to what works best for you. Perfect. Perfect. So um, quick question about the alcohol. Um, when you talk about the beer and the steak, will you never absorb the zinc in that steak? Well, it's or just you... that it works kind of as, as a displacing agent. So it's kind of like if I was, uh, the best example is if you think of like a, one of those ping pong things that at the yeah. ping pong machine when the ball is trying to go down and the thing is flicking it away it's kind of effectively how it works that you're obviously going to get you may get a little bit of it but it's going to work as a displacing agent it's going to try and push it away so that it doesn't get absorbed which is effectively what happens and it's, it's how it works okay all right in your book you talked about something called find your way tell about find your way so find find your why is is probably find your why is there so that's the, in the mindset section is it Yes. Yeah. So find your why is, again, that's for me, this looks very, very different for every person, but I'll use my own why as context for this answer and then I'll explain how people can find it. What I've always found and one of the things that set me back in a lot of areas of my life, particularly in fitness, and this goes for mindset, this goes for relationships, this goes for jobs, is not having a strong enough why or not knowing why you're doing something. Like 
I know myself that when particularly starting a, a fitness regimen first, going to the gym, starting to do more walks or runs or jogs, you can do it. And everyone does it. I always use New Year's as an example. Everyone gets on the New Year's bandwagon after Christmas. We all buy a treadmill or get a gym membership or we start exercising more. And then after six weeks, we're stopped and we're done because we didn't have a strong enough why. We didn't have a reason. So, for example, the content, the one I gave in the book was I've got a little girl. My little girl is two. And she's effectively my why. So when I get up at 5 or 6 a.m. every morning, and I'm tired, I'm not a morning person. Like, I hate getting up in the morning. Um, but, and I love my life, but I still struggle to get out of bed. But I've got a picture of my little girl beside my bed. So that works as a, either a conscious or subconscious way to, right, you need to get up and work today. Because if you don't, you can't put a roof over your head. You can't put food in her mouth. And these things that, like, I'm fortunate. I do well in, in, in my living. But these little subconscious cues that I use allow me to work through the harder days when you're turning in November in Ireland when it's wet and cold and windy outside and you still got to get up at 5 a.m. to, you know, write your blog post or when I was working on the book or record a podcast or whatever it is I'm doing, I use that as a why. But people will use different things for their why. When people are starting off a fitness regimen first, sometimes it may be a negative comment that somebody had towards you and you're using that and refueling that, rechalling that energy into a more positive thing. Like, it's funny, it's a bit of a catch-22 again with negative comments because they can break you completely if somebody calls you fat or someone calls you skinny or someone calls you stupid, which is one of the reasons why I read so many books. I read two or three books a week. And that, that, that came down to one of my friends calling me stupid once and it really landed and hit with me. And I was like, you know what, maybe he's right. I actually, I've only read like three books in my life. And then from the age of 24 on, I've read, I read two or three books every week. So that came down to me using that energy because energy is never lost, it's transferred and you effectively just use it into something more creative. So when you're trying to find your why, it's basically the thing that gets you doing it when you don't want to do it. You know, it's very easy to get motivated. You can plug in a music or song or a YouTube video and get motivated, but that's not good for keeping you on track long term. Like what I talk about in the book, the key to success in all areas of life, and I'm using myself as my own best example and people I've worked with, is having a strong why and then creating daily habits so that it becomes automatic. Like when you're making right automatic choices about your food, about your training, so you're doing programs that you enjoy, you're eating foods that you like and that fit into your schedule, and then you have a why, a comment somebody said to you, an event or a wedding you're working towards, you your, want your daughter or your son or whoever to be more proud of you, whatever it is, finding your why and then using daily habits and putting the right steps in place every single day is what leads to long-term success for people. And, and fitness is just a, a metaphor for everything in life because how you do anything is how you do everything. So if you do your fitness like that, you're going to do your relationships like that, you do your job like that, and then it just crosses over into all areas of your life. That's, that's, that's fantastic. And I really like the idea of, because it is something consistent with what we talk about, that you know you, you have to, the, the beginning part is so important to, to create those habits, because if you don't create the habits, it's going to fall off. Like you said, you know, with the New Year's resolutions, you know, it doesn't take long before you are back to what you were doing before, because that was your habit. And the, the, the importance of creating habits and, and making it just part of a, your routine. This is just what I do. This is just what I eat. This is just what my schedule is and, and, and working from that perspective. That's great. key for long-term success. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So this uh, system, I don't know how to pronounce his name, doing the reward. Oh, Charles, du choose, Charles Dewey. Yeah. He wrote the book, The Power of Habit. Which is a is a great read for anyone that's looking at building long term habits. It's one of my favorites. Now, I've tried. I have tried when I read about routine Q reward. I didn't know about him until I read your book. Ru <laughs> routine Q reward. So I tried it. It didn't work. What do you going to advise me? Help um, me if if it didn't work, it's a case of you may have hacked the wrong part of the system. Okay. So, for example, um, you've got your routine, which is effectively the habit you're trying to break and and change and you've got your cue which is what happens that's triggering it off so for example in the book i talked about i used to work as a primary school teacher in london it was what i was doing before i set up my own business and became in working with people in fitness 
Um, and I had this really, really bad habit of my routine where I'd come home after school every day at you know, yeah. half past four or 5 p.m. And my cue was I'd walk into my front door, I would get out one of these big, massive bars of chocolate, like one of those huge Hershey bars. Um, and I would sit down and I would literally watch the game shows that were on. So I think you've got some of them, uh, the Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, The Chase, these kind of game shows. And every single day I was doing that. And my reward was I was getting obviously a serotonin hit from the chocolate and I was relaxing and chilling out. Then after a certain point, I, my body composition started to go the wrong way. I started to add more body fat. And I was, I was always pretty athletic. I played a lot of sports. But my body fat was starting to climb. Um, and then I realized that I created a really bad habit. So I read Charles' book. Um, and I was like, right, I need to hack this somewhere. So for me, I couldn't change the routine of coming home every day. That was always going to be the same because I worked, you know, eight to four in school. And then I'd come home and that routine was always going to be the same. But my, my cue, instead of going into our, my kitchen, which is literally exactly what happened, like sometimes I'm talking to people and they're like, oh, I eat chocolate every evening when I come home from work. And I'm like, I bet you're sitting in the same chair. I bet you're watching the same shows. You probably have the same drink in front of you. And we do, and we all create the, and they're like, yeah, how did you know? And I'm like, because I did it as well. Like, because we all do it. And what I realized was I couldn't change the routine, but I could change the cue. So instead of walking into my house, I started pre-packing a gym bag and I left it at the front door. So what I did was I'd come home every day, I'd drop off my school bag and I'd pick up my gym bag and I went to the gym. And then my new reward was a serotonin hit that I was getting from the gym. And then after a couple of weeks, like they say, the University of London did a study that it takes 66 days to create a new habit. After that, that became a new habit. And then I wasn't going for the bar of chocolate and sitting down watching the game shows every evening. The new habit had been formed. So when you're trying to get into that system, it's making sure that you're changing the right thing because you can change one of the three, you know, the, 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 depending on the situation, it's just finding which one is the best one for you. And then when that works, double down on that um, until you've got your new habit in place. Uh, okay. Take 66 days. I think it's 66 days. The University of London did a study that to create a new habit, it takes 66 days. So if you're still a month in and you haven't completely become a habit, mm -hmm. power on mm -hmm. for another month. And, and it's amazing what happens because then it becomes nearly automatic. And again, you're making the right automatic choices then because all we are are habits. Like I love the Aristotle quote, we are what we repeatedly do. So if you're repeatedly doing good things that are serving you, you're going to repeatedly have things that serve you. So and if you're not, the same thing works in reverse. So... It's just making sure that it works for each person and then building your life around that. Right. In this country, it takes 30 days, 60 days, or 90 days to build a new habit. But I like the 66. It probably is about 66 days. Yeah. I don't think 30 is enough to build yeah, a new I, habit. Yeah, I find myself it takes a little bit longer for, right. for me and me personally. Yeah. yeah, it does for me too. Me too. And, and it reminds me, what you're saying reminds me of... Um, when I was in school, I remember somebody saying, you know, everybody would always talk about practice makes perfect. And they said, no, practice doesn't make perfect. Practice makes permanent. And so you, the, the more that you do something, the more consistent, the mm -hmm. more routine, the more permanent it becomes. Uh, so whether it's a good habit or a bad habit, right. the, the more you do it, the, the more you're going to do it. Yeah, 100%. Like I always think of habits like, you know, seeds in the ground. Like if you have a massive oak tree, that's going to be way harder to move than some seeds from the ground. And if, and if that oak tree has been growing for years, like I use the example, sometimes I work with people that come through my programs that have been overweight or obese, you know, 20 years, 30 years, and they're not in shape after six weeks. And I'm like, the, the example I normally use is, what if I told you I wanted to be fluent in Spanish in three weeks? Would you tell me it was possible? You'd be like, it's probably not going to be possible. It's probably going to be hard. Or what if I said I want to be fluent in Spanish in 12 months, 18 months, two years? Then it becomes way more realistic. And that's kind of, if you've been doing bad habits for 20 years, you've been smoking for 20 years, you've been drinking every night for 20 years, you've been eating fast food for 20 years, you're not going to change that in two weeks. But you may completely change it in 18 months, two years' time, and then you're, you're, you're reaping that benefits for the rest of your life. Um, and I, that's something that I usually use with my clients just to kind of reframe their mindset when they're not getting immediate results um, when they've been doing something for 20 years. Yeah. What, what I really like about almost everything that you're saying, that's, that underlying theme is, you know, you got to stick with it because we're, we're so into immediate gratification. And I think that that's where we get into like, you know, medications and we, we, people want that, that immediate change, that immediate result that they want. And that's, it's not realistic to think that way or to expect that way. And, and if you want to, uh, you know, just the example that you just gave. You know, you can do this work for two years and then it's going to benefit you the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. 
you know, I, I'm, I'm sure that there's people who hear that and say, I got to do this for two years, <laughs> you know, and, and it's, they're, they're not, some people have such difficult, such a difficult time thinking about long term, you know, they, they want it right now. And, and I think that that's a, a huge obstacle for a lot of people. I'm sure that you experienced that with a lot of your clients. 100%. It's one of the biggest reframes. It's why, again, as I said, fitness is a metaphor for life because you don't get into it. Like, I'm 17 years training. Like, you don't get into shape in two weeks. You know, it takes longer. You build the habits and you make the right automatic choices over a long period of time and you reap the results. But one of the things I always tell people, they're like, I don't have two years to do this. I'm like, well, the time is going to pass anyway. So you may as well do the right things that are going to support you. Um, and people are that normally kind of kicks in and going, I suppose you're right. They're like, oh, it took three years to do this with your business or it took 10 years to do this with training. And I was like, well, the time is passing. I was like, I'm just making the right choices between now and then. Right. Yeah. It's, like it's, it's going to be there anyways. That time is going to be there anyways. So might as well. Yeah. Hey, Brian, you talk a lot about fear and anxiety. Why? Why is that uh, a, kind of a central theme? Largely because from, and again, this is down to my own issues that I've had working through my fitness journey. And then uh, I'm looking at thousands of people come through my programs every year. And when I'm working with them, there was a common trend of people either self-sabotaging through fear or anxiety, stress, worry, cortisol, which is cortisol is basically your stress hormone. And then worry, anxiety, and, and fear are all kind of the same, different sides of the same coin. Um, in terms of fear, fear and anxiety are two very different, but they're two different things, as I talk about that in the book. Like a fear is an immediate threat that something may happen to you. Like what's wired in our evolutionary genome that if you saw a saber-toothed tiger, you were going to run away because you were going to be fearful that you may got, get eaten. Anxiety isn't that. Anxiety is the fear of immediate threat without there being an immediate threat. So basically it's when you're getting up in your own head about something. So I kind of separate that they're, they're two different things, you know, there's two sides of the same coin. Um, and what happens with a lot of people is they let the anxieties, they let the fear, I love the acronym for fear, false evidence appearing real. And they let fear and they let anxiety and they let their stress and all, all of these things stop them keeping their mindset clear for happiness, for anxiety, for your body composition. Like I talk in the book that stress is the figurative death by a thousand cuts when you're trying to get into shape. What happens is when we know how to get into better shape, generally we eat less food, we eat better food and we exercise more. But that's still not the case how people can get into a certain shape and they can't keep it because they have anxiety, they have stress, they have worry, they have lack of energy, they have all these things that effectively stop you keeping it. It's one of the reasons I wrote the book. Like they always say, write the book that you want to read and write the book that will help people. And I wrote it in the, for the people that followed me and for anyone else that ever reads it, that, well, here's the fitness section. The whole book is broken into two sections. The whole first section is nutrition, supplements, training, sleep, alcohol, hydration, everything you need to get into amazing shape. The mindset section then is all the things you need to keep it. So dealing with stress, dealing with anxiety, dealing with worry, understanding the different things that are going on within you so that you don't self-sabotage yourself, creating the right habits, finding your why so that you're able to get into amazing shape and keep it. And as I said, how you do anything is how you do everything. So even though it's a fitness book, it, the Amazon reviews, like it's got 225 star reviews on Amazon books been on a month and people have been like, it's the mindset section. They're like, I never thought about it that way. I'm like, I know because I was that guy. I wrote, that book was for me. But if I had read it five years ago when I was going through my own stress and anxiety and worries and I talked about my time in London when that was happening to me, um, and it's basically just wanting to write it. So I, I used a Brandon Mull quote at the end of the book, smart people learn from their mistakes, the really sharp ones learn from the mistakes of others. And I effectively wrote the book to cut the learning curve of people that are going through that now. Um, and fear and anxiety is just one of those things that can massively self-sabotage people. So it's why it's a central theme in that mindset section of the book. Yeah, that's, that, that's great. And, you know, it, it ties in even with what we were talking about before, because we know that, you know, chronic stress leads to chronic um, presence of cortisol in your system. And, you know, cortisol, while it's such a necessary thing for, you know, acute injuries or acute issues, when it's in your system on a chronic basis like that, it, we get right back to that inflammation issue and we get right back to, you know, cortisol is, is a, one of the primary hormones that increases blood, glu uh, blood glucose levels and yeah. it, it increases storage of, of fatty deposits. And we, we know that all of those things happen when we're chronically stressed. But yet, as you said, you know, we focus on one piece 
maybe the fitness piece, but we're not focusing on the mindset piece. And, and so we're self-sabotage. Yeah. And that's what happens. And, and it, it's a case of it's the holistic approach is what keeps people on track long term. It's when you're able to fix everything that's going on, not only knowing to exercise more and eat real food and eat whole foods and eat things that are going to give you more energy, all the stuff that we kind of know, the majority of people know exercise more, eat less if you want to lose body fat or eat more real food or whole foods. But some of the stuff that we might not know is what I talked about in the mindset section, the anxiety, the stress, the worry, the fear, the habits, creating your why, all of these things that can allow you to basically be happier in everything that you do. And if you do get into the shape that you're happy and you have the mindset that you're able to keep it forever. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So that's why dogs are happier. That's why dogs are happier. <laughs> I, I, this is one of my favorite parts of the book. Um, like I wrote a lot of my book via social media. So what I did with uh, when I was writing it, I've got probably 150,000 across my platforms. And what I did with the book was I started seeding out different topics to people and I put them as blog posts and said, right, these are the sections of the book that I'm thinking of talking about. And the ones that people responded to the most, the ones that got likes and shares and comments, I like I cut the book down to 30,000 words. It was 60. I took out everything that didn't fly on social media that people were like, well, that didn't help as much. And I kept everything and rewrote it and then put it into the book oh. and then used the, my platform off social media. So that's how I knew the book was going to help a lot of people because when I was writing it, I was basically using the direct feedback that people gave and what was helping the most. That whole section on why your dog may be happier than you was because I got so many private messages and emails as a result of putting that on social media that I was like, right, this needs to go into the book. So I rewrote it um, and I tied it in and factored it into the mindset section. Effectively, why your dog might be happier than you is basically it's just evolutionary reasons that are, as species, sapiens, human people, have developed our free prefrontal cortex. It's the part of our brain that effectively allows us to do reasoning and allows us to see the vision of the future. It allows us to think things through. It's why we were able to evolve and become the top of the food chain effectively. We were able to work in social groups. We were able to see the long-term vision of things. Animals, dogs particularly, don't have that design. It's why when you walk into your house, your dog goes crazy every time they see you. It's because they haven't got that vision now they're not worried about oh am i going to get my food tomorrow or is he going to let me out to play in the park next week they don't think about that because that part of their brain hasn't been developed we as a species have that part developed and it's incredible because it's allowed us to build civilizations it's allowed us to do amazing things like you can literally architect your own life by creating the thoughts because of the vision that you have in your own mind's eye animals dogs particularly don't have that however because we have that again it's a catch-22 like most things it can also lead us to worrying about things that may not happen. Right. Am I going to be able to pay my bills next month? Am I going to be able to put food in my daughter's mouth? Am I going to be able to you know, look nice for my night out so that I can get a boyfriend or a girlfriend or a husband or a wife or all these things? That comes down to our prefrontal cortex and our ability to see the vision and see things that may happen. So again, if you use it, it can be the most serving thing that you ever have because you can literally hold in your mind's eye the version of the person you want to be, the body you want to have, the job you want to have, the relationship you want to have, and then you can work towards that regardless of your belief system, whether you believe in you know, the universe and the secrets, law of attraction and the universe conspires for you, or whether you believe in the neuroscience of your reticular activation system kicking in and your internal brain GPS working towards the end goal, regardless of your belief system, you can create anything you want if you hold the end vision in mind because of your prefrontal cortex, because that is designed in species or, or in designed in our species and in people. But as a result, it can also lead to a lot of negativity because we have worry, we have anxiety about things that may not ever happen. Right. Like you can never, I, I read a lot of like Greek, Greek and Roman philosophy because it helps me with my mindset. And I love Seneca, I love Marcus Aurelius and they talk about that happiness and unhappiness is never confined to the present. It never is in this moment in time. It's always something that might happen or something that did happen. And when you're thinking about the things that happened that were negative to you in the past that you can't change, you're always going to be unhappy thinking about that. When you think about things that may go bad in the future, you're thinking about those things that might go wrong. Right now, in this very present moment, that doesn't happen because you're normally, unless you're in you know, a concentration camp or you're in something, like I love Viktor Frankl's book, The Man's Search for Meaning, the, the concentration camp and he came through and his mindset within it, the truth is, it's very, very rare is it confined in the Western world is our unhappiness confined to the present. It's normally down to something that's going to happen or something that has happened in our past. I love the serenity prayer that God grant me the serenity to understand the things I can't change, 
the wisdom to, to, to or the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Now, I'm not overly religious, but I love that as a saying and as a philosophy. And again, it's down to just understanding that we as a species are wired that way. But when you understand that, you can take ownership of it, and then you can control it. And you realize there's nothing wrong with you. When you're stressing about paying bills, when you're stressing about not having a husband or a wife or meeting someone that's going to be your soulmate, when you're worrying about these things, we've all been there. There's no new problems out there. They've all been written down somewhere. You just got to go find them. And then when you understand that there's nothing wrong with you for feeling that way, you can take control of it. You can take ownership of it. And then it just does never seem as bad when there's other people that you realize that were going through the same thing that you're feeling right now. Absolutely. 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 I mean, all of that is so well said because, and it's something that, um, something that we work therapeutically with people mm -hmm. because we, we become so um, hyper attuned to the what ifs um, or the, the should haves and we get so connected to that that we can't let it go we just we just can't release it and, and live right now okay. and, and we, we've, we've talked before about you know some of the challenges people have with living right now and they find all these reasons not to live right now well i have a you know i have a test next week so i have to think about the future or i have this and it, they it's so difficult for some folks to understand that living right now doesn't mean that you're not planning for the future it yeah. just means that you're doing what you can right now it's not it's not worrying about what you're going to do in the future it's doing what you can right now to prepare for right now and in the future and th that discrepancy is really difficult for some people yeah, well, it's a learned skill. It's the same as a muscle. Like happiness, and I talked about this in the book, happiness is like a muscle. Your muscle gets stronger from working it every single day. If I stop working out and stop training, I would lose the muscle on my body. If I stop working towards being happier and reducing my anxiety and all these things every single day, you, it, it atrophies, you lose it. So it's not a case of, well, okay, this is the book I'm gonna read, I'm gonna read Brian's book, and I'm gonna be fixed, and I'm gonna be perfect forever. You have gotta do the right things every, sing every day. It's kinda of like sweeping the floor. Like You can sweep the floor in your kitchen, and it's gonna be clean for a day, but if you leave it for a week, it's gonna get dirty again. So doing that every single day, and staying on top of it, it's why I read a lot of the books that I read is why I consume the information I consume purely to serve me and help me. And as a result, I can help and serve more people with this. But it's a case of understanding that there's nothing wrong with you feeling that way, but also taking ownership of it and realizing that it's under your control. And as you said, when you're working with people, the what ifs and should haves, and you realize that that's not serving you, then get rid of it. By all means, keep the belief systems that help you, but the ones that don't, get rid of them. Yeah, we do spend our time talking about the past mm -hmm. and what might happen in the future. Right. right? That's, what, that's where we spend our professional lives, is talking to people about the right. past and, and what ifs. Yeah, I mean, one of the that's most- That's what they're worried about. One of the most debilitating, I think, um, anxieties that you see in, in folks sometimes is that anticipatory anxiety. The, the yeah. anxiety of, yeah. uh, that oh, yeah. of anticipating mm -hmm. something that right. you know, may or may not ever happen, uh, right. but it just is, is so, in, you know, impairing and, and intrusive in every aspect of their body and in, in their life. Um, it, it's really difficult for some folks to deal with that. Yeah, but that's it. But that's what, as you said, when you're working with them, sometimes all you're doing is pulling an idea from the back of your head to the front of consciousness. And when you're helping people, and, you're, and I'm sure you've seen it with people you've worked with, sometimes just drawing them to the fact that that's the thing they're doing, that's the form of self-sabotage or whatever label you want to put on it, and they realize that they're getting into an anxious state, that anticipatory anxiety, sometimes just recognizing that there's a trend there and they keep doing it can be enough to take ownership of it and then change it. You know, but again, it comes down to, as you've seen, working with people, doing it every single day and just making people aware there's nothing wrong with you for feeling that way, but understanding that it's not helping you and serving you, then you can put the steps in place to change it. Absolutely. It, it sounds like you do a lot of um, almost, well, sports psychology in, in your work with, with your clients and with the, with the um, different people that you work with. It, it sounds like you really are working with mind and body. Yeah. Well, that's because... Again, the, the, the reason that I wrote the book the way I wrote it and the reason I work with people the way I work with them is down to the fact that I was working with people and giving them nutritional plans and giving them training programs and they were getting into shape and then they'd go off on their own and six months later they'd be back to where they were. And I'm like, but what happened? They were like, oh, well, you know, this happened with my job or this happened with my partner or this happened, something, life gets in the way because life gets in the way, that's what happens. But normally then I realized that to fix the mindset, 
you can go out on your own and do it and, and, and keep the results you get. And very much, I feel it's very hard to do one without the other. Because as I said, it's not rocket science to lose body fat. We eat less food and we do more exercise. You go out running or, or just burning more calories and you eat less food and you choose whole foods that give you energy, you're going to see a change in your body from that, you know? But it's not about that because there's loads of books out there that do that. There's loads of YouTube videos. I put up loads of content that, that can show you how to do that. It's delving into the things that aren't keeping you on track long term, which is all about the mindset. It's why I do so much of that side of things with my clients and the people I work with because I'm not trying to get you into shape for six weeks or 12 weeks and then you go back and you fall and go back to where you were. I'm like, I want to teach you something that you can use. It may take 90 days or whatever it is. And then you have it for your next 90 years because you stay on top of it every day by you know reading my book, following different podcasts, listening to your podcast, listening to mine, following different YouTube people, whatever it is that's helping you. But you have the foundations in place that are going to serve you and help you you're way after 90 days or eight weeks or 12 weeks or however long you're coming to my program or, or anybody else's in that matter. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> hey, Brian, can you explain to our viewers the be, do, and have model? So the be, do, and have is, this is one of the things that I had to deal with myself and it was so fresh even when I wrote the book. And one of the reasons that I'm so proud of the mindset section of the book is because when I reread it, and I do, when I reread it, I get something from it every time because it brings you back to that place when you wrote it first. Um, and the B2 have is effectively what happens in life. And I was this guy, like this is how I'm able to offer this input that, okay, when I have a six pack, I can become successful and I can attract, you know, uh, a really pretty girlfriend and I can have, have respect from people and I'll get all this when I have my six pack or I have a new car or I have a big house. I can, I can then... I can be the person I want to be. I can be successful. When the truth is, that's the be, do, have model, where people are, or that's the have, do, be model. Whereas effectively, if you become the person and wait for reality to catch up with that version of you, everything you want to have will come as a result. When you become a fit person in your mind, when you become someone that has more energy in your mind, when you become that person first and then create the habits and you have the knowledge, of course, that allows you to support that, then you can do the things you want to do. Like you can have, you can do the, the lifestyle that you want to live that allows you to have a bigger house, to have a nicer car, to have a six pack or whatever it is, where people flip it. And what happens is we put our happiness into the external things of the nice car, the pretty girlfriend, the um, attractive partner, you know, all these things that are effectively external things that can be taken away in a blink of an eye. But we put all of our happiness into the external things. And then as a result, we tie who we are to the things that we have. So when those things get taken away, you lose your self-worth. And I get that. I was the fitness guy. And when I didn't have a six-pack or I didn't have abs, I felt horrible about myself because I had tied my, I have a six-pack. I'm that guy. And I tied all of my self-worth to the way that I looked. Where now it's, well, now that's, I, I become the version of the person I want to be. And then you have all these things as a result. You have your nice car, you have a nice house, you have your six pack, you have your body, you have your relationship, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, you have all these things, but they're not who you are. They're not who you've become. You know, all of those external things, it doesn't create you, it's not the title that makes you, it's not the house that makes you, it's the character and the person you become. And as a result of getting the things you want, you become a stronger version of you on the other side, and you can have all of those things. And again, it's just something that was so fresh for me when I was writing the book, as I was just coming out of it, and it's something I still reread so that I don't, because we get caught up with ego or hubris or bravado or whatever it is that we're like, oh yeah, look at you know my six pack or look at my car, or look at my house, or look at my girlfriend or look at all of these things that effectively when you put your happiness into the external things that can be taken away from you, you're always going to look for something external to provide that happiness. And the truth is it comes from within you and that comes from becoming the version of you you want to be and then waiting for everything else to catch up with that so you can have all those things on top of it. That's great. Because so so the the idea is um, you got to be who you are, and that's going to lead to the things that you that you receive or the the, the life that you live. Um, I, I love the idea of you know internal action than external, as opposed to trying yeah. to get the external things then have do an action and feel as though that's going to become who you are because it's it's much more superficial. Um, we do. We all do it. Like I, I can't speak for anybody. I'm not speaking for everybody. I, I did. <laughs> yeah. You know, and it's something that when you catch it and you take ownership of it, 
your happiness can just 10x, 100x as a result because now you're just becoming the version of the person you want to be and all the other things you're in bonus territory as opposed to putting all your self-worth into the things that you have. Right. Yeah, that's great. That's a great model. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we've kept you for a long time. There's so many more things to talk about. Did you have any you know, questions? Bert, I, I, I've blocked it off. I'm, I'm, having a great, I'm having a great time with this. <laughs> yeah, this is fantastic. Well, I do, but um, is having a why necessary? Um, I think you have to reverse engineer you. Um, I think everybody's wired differently and there's no one size fits all with everything in life. And I talk about that in the book. If there was one training program or one nutritional plan that was the best for body for losing body fat, everybody would do that and everybody would be lean and everyone would be skinny. There isn't. It's about reverse engineering what works best for you. There's parameters that are going to help most people, but you also have to figure out what works best for you. For me, having a why is, is I need it. Like I can't get out of bed at 5 a.m., if I don't have a strong enough why, because I hate getting up in the morning, you know, and I, again, I'm, I'm someone that's very fortunate, I love my life, but I'm so groggy and tired in the morning, and when it's dark and dreary outside, I just don't want to get out of bed, but my why helps me on those days, if you're somebody, and it depends, I don't need a why to go to the gym, I love training, and it makes me feel good, and it gives me good energy, so my why doesn't have to be strong in that area of my life, but my why needs to be strong in my business to get up at 5 a.m. So it's a case of reverse engineering you. If you're someone that doesn't like to work out and doesn't like to eat quote unquote healthy, and a lot of not liking eating healthy is down to not understanding that you can make really healthy food really tasty. It's just being a bit more creative with it. And that's just a reframing of your mindset. But when you're somebody that doesn't like those things naturally, you may need a stronger why there. You know, like it's funny, I have a lot of, I've got some young guys that have a sports program where I have a lot of 17, 18 year old college athletes coming through. And sometimes their why is they want to hook up with a hotter girl. <laughs> like, I'm like, well, then you use that why. You know, my why is my two year old daughter, but they'll have, you know, a girl that they want to hook up with. So it looks completely different and depending on where you are in your life, and depending on your gender and depending on what's important to you on your value ladder and what's the most important, your why may be completely different. But there's no right or wrong why. And sometimes you don't need a why in the parts of your life that you love. If you love to read, you're not going to need a lot of an external cue to help you pick up a book because it's something what you love to do. But something if you're someone that hates to work out, you may need a strong why in order to get out of bed to train in the morning or go after work when you're tired. Um, so I think it's reverse engineering you and then doubling down on the things that are that work and support you long term. Okay. Yeah. One pers one personal note here. You were 24 when you did what? You were moved back to You said when, when I you were when I moved, say that again? You were 24. What did you do at 24? So when I was 24, I moved back home to Ireland. Is that is that what you yeah, yeah, yeah. so mm -hmm. I was living in California. Uh, I was I was living in California when I was 21 to 22 and then I moved back to London. Um, and I worked as a primary school teacher in London. Um, so I was there for four years working as a primary school teacher. I moved back when I was 25. Um, effectively, I've, I've, I've been very, very fortunate. Like I moved back, I had to go on welfare when I moved back. I moved in with my mom and dad. I was driving my sister's little 99 Toyota Yaris. I didn't know what started every morning. Um, and I, again, I, I wanted to get my fitness business off the ground. It was my dream. I was like, well, this is I talk about in the book that I was walking home one night from work and I was reading Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, which is one of my favorite books. And he was speaking about, well, have a vision of yourself at your funeral and see what people are saying about you. And the thoughts that I was conjuring in my mind weren't, I wasn't very happy with myself. I was like, wow, I feel I was put here to do something more and help more people. Now I loved my job. I loved working with my kids in elementary school. I loved doing that. But it wasn't the thing I would have done for free. Like what I do now, my podcasts I make, the videos I make, the books I write, all of these things are if I had a billion dollars in my bank account, I would be doing for free. That's how I knew that I'm like, well, I'm on my right path now. Because when you wake up every morning and what you would do, you would do for free. And I'm very fortunate that I have a best-selling book. I have, you know, a number one podcast. I have hundreds of thousands across my different platforms. I'm very, very fortunate to have all those things. But the real success of that for me comes down to waking up every morning and realizing, well, I would do this for free. Um, and when I moved back to Ireland and I started back from scratch effectively, um, I was very, very grateful over the last four years or so to be able to build up to what I have. Um, and that largely comes down to your, your be, do, have model where you become that version of that person you want to be. And then you just wait for reality to catch up. Yeah. Well, the personal part is I have a 24 year old son. He's going to get a copy of your book. 
Nice. Right. And he's going to read it, <laughs> and he's going to talk to his dad about it. <laughs> and I'm going to let you know <laughs> how it's going. Oh, okay? please do. Tell him to add me. Tell him to hit me up on DM on Instagram, and I'm sure if he's 24, he's 100% on Instagram. He's going to love me he's, 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 tell, tell, him, tell me who he is. Um, I'm dying to hear how he finds it. He's going to love you, and I'm going to have him get in touch with you. And he's 24 <laughs> years old, and he's going to start as soon as the book arrives. I love it. Okay? I love it. Amazing. Thank you. Fantastic. Well, we have definitely kept you. We're, we're approaching an hour now, so I, and I know that your time is uh, spent doing all kinds of different things. Any any last words that you have for, for our listeners, at, at least for this interview? We, we hope to have you on many, many more times. Yeah, I'd love to come on again. I've got a ball on this. This has been amazing. Thank you both so much for having me on. Yeah, no um, Yeah, no, not too much. If you want to hear, see more about me, you can you can just search me in Google. Um, I'm on all the platforms, my, my YouTube my Facebook, my Instagram is all Brian Keen Fitness. My Snapchat's Brian K019. My podcast is the Brian Keen Fitness Podcast. Um, and my website's www.brianKeenFitness.com. So um, check me out on all of those. I put different things on every platform. So you can literally, you'll get different things on anyone you follow me on. So uh, hopefully I can provide more value. I try and put out as much as I can um, to, to know more than need to help as many people as I can. Because that's number one. Like legacy has always been number one. Um, and everything else is a, is a second um, so check me out on there and hopefully I can provide more value to anyone that, that's been listening today and got value in this. Fantastic. Well, Thank we'll you. definitely put a link to all of those platforms and everything in the show notes so people can, can follow you. And um, definitely, you know, I, I, I've listened to a couple of the podcasts. Um, great stuff. Great stuff. And so we'll yeah. put a link to that as, as well because that, that's, all, that's all great stuff. Um, so, man, we really appreciate we really appreciate you sticking with us because I know that we've tried to do this a couple of times over the... Yeah, yeah thanks so for hanging in. Really appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> but it's been fantastic. And as I said, you are, of course, welcome um, on the show anytime you ever ever want to come back and talk yes. about anything that you want to talk about, whether it's the, the next book that you're working on or any yeah. any other activities, things that you have going on. You're, you're always welcome. That would be amazing. Thank you so much. I can't wait for round two. <laughs> Absolutely. So... All right, well, have a great rest of your day, and we'll, we'll talk to you again. Brilliant. Thanks so much for having me on again. All right, man. Bye-bye.